Open your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11. Second Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 11. I'll read that verse and we'll go back to study some other verses. Now God is preparing his sons to be the right kind and the right type of soldiers. He said, my sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to do four things, to stand before him, to serve him, that you should minister unto him, and to worship him or to burn incense. Now keep that in mind, and if you'll go back, you'll find in chapter 28 of this same book, Second Chronicles chapter 28, we meet a man by the name of Ahaz. Now Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Ahaz started reigning at the ripe old age of 20, and he reigned for 16 years. And it is told us that he did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made molten images uh, for Balaam. He burnt incense in the valley of the sons of Hinnom and burnt his children with fire or in the fire. He offered his own children as offerings to these false gods after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Now drop down to verse 26. Now the rest of his acts, that is the acts of Ahaz, and all of his ways, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not unto the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. In other words, he did not have royal, a royal funeral. They buried him even in Jerusalem, but they did not bring him unto the sepulchres of the rulers of Israel. And he tells us, the writer that Hezekiah's son reigned in his stead. I'd like to uh, suggest some things in the light of the hour in which we live in a rather strange and unusual period in human history. It seems that hardly anyone in our world today, the leaders of the free world, hardly know what to uh, uh, to do in the light of the world economy, uh, the breakdown of communism in the, what used to be the Soviet Empire, and uh, now already they're fighting and skirmishes all over the world practically. Someone asked me the other day, said, uh, Reverend Rawlings, what do you think uh, that's out in the future? I said, well, let's a loaded question, but I said, I think the Lord's coming back. Every area of human life points in that direction. But we need to understand, if we are living in the last days, that there's an obligation and responsibility to people living in this hour to live in the fashion and the manner, the way the Lord wants us to live our lives. We've got a Madonna mentality in this country. We don't have any, uh, we don't have any, uh, uh, we don't have any respect like the woman, the rock singer, uh, on stage having a picture of the Pope and and uh, tearing the picture into shreds. Uh, there's not anything that is uh, sacred. There's not anything that's holy today. Uh, you'd be surprised how all of this is affecting the mentality of our younger generation. And there's an awesome responsibility upon uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to look at ourselves and, and ask ourselves, am I living for myself or am I living for the Lord? 
Now that applies to both the believer and the unbeliever because each one of us are responsible and we have to answer. You can be a Christian and certainly not live for the Lord. Do you think Peter, when he was following the Lord afar off, was making any progress? Do you think Israel for 40 years in the wilderness did anything constructively for the Lord? Come on. Do you think back yonder in the dark ages, uh, the, re the religious people, the 400 years before the baby was born in Bethlehem, do you think they were doing anything constructive? Well, what about this sanctuary? What about now? How many of you have spent time to ask yourselves, well, what am I supposed to do? What plan does God have for my life? If I might use my seniority, I'd like to testify to all of you younger people that the greatest moment in my life, other than when I came to Jesus Christ, was when I yielded my life to the Master and made myself available to Him to be used by Him and for Him in whatever capacity that it would please God to use me. That's it. Now you're either living for self, that's why the Lord said, uh, if we lose our lives for His sake, we'll save our lives. Now, with that in mind, let's look at this man, Hezekiah. If you're going to be something for God, now listen carefully. You're going to have to pick out somebody or something as a guidepost. You, uh, you have to have help. You can't make it by yourself. You know what the Lord said? Follow me. Now just think about this for a moment. That's very explicit. Follow me. And then he tells us how to arm ourselves. He said, take up your cross and do this daily and follow me. Now, notice this young chap. He was... Uh, 25 years old when he began to reign, he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. That's chapter 29 of 2 Chronicles and verse 1. And his mother's name was Abijah, and uh, he, she was the daughter of Zechariah. Now, we begin to get acquainted with this man, and if you want to improve yourself, did you notice in the paper today that much is said by the three men running for the presidents of the United States about our schools? Don't any of them have the answer. It's an amazing thing to me that uh, everything is glossed over. No one has addressed the fact that back yonder when the Supreme Court said you couldn't pray in a public school, you couldn't have the Bible in the public school, that the curse of God is upon the public school and will remain upon the public schools. I mean, it's not a short-lived thing. It's going to be that way unless there is a turning to God and the American people wake up. Perot doesn't have the answer. Bush doesn't have the answer. Clinton doesn't have the answer. Because in the first place, Clinton doesn't think life is too important. He's like Perot, he believes a woman's body belongs to her. If that philosophy is carried all the way through, uh, then every dope addict in this city has a right to his own body to do and use whatever he wants to. And they're, they're banning smoking in all of these places. If I have an appetite to smoke, uh, why shouldn't I be willing to smoke if a woman have a, has appetite for sex and she becomes pre uh, uh, pregnant, then uh, her body still belongs to her according to the Supreme Court, and according to Clinton, and according to the, uh, the abortionist. You see, that it's, we live in an illogical age. Don't you understand that? And people are not addressing the issues. And uh, the, the judgment and damnation of God Almighty is upon public education in this country. And you might as well face up to it just like, a, uh, just like Ahaz offered uh, his children in the fire. Uh, we are offering our children on the altar of damnation teaching them that they came from a lower species of animals. I don't know why the American people can't get that through their heads. 
You're not going to have improvement in education. You got to start within a child. He has to learn moral responsibilities and accountabilities. He's got to understand that he's a human being and he has to bridle his lust. All right, now, in verse 2, he said he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. We need to get it in our minds and hearts. There is absolutely no substitute for doing that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. When I told you the story the other Sunday about the man, the minister I had, I had lunch with and told you about his wife being a lesbian and just two weeks before that he buried his son that died with AIDS and he told that terrible, tragic story uh, the boy did to his daddy. Well, you know, whatsoever a man soweth, he'll reap. And the Bible said that God visits the sins of the fathers even to the fourth generation. Now you talk about hell being hot, you, you just chew on that one a while. And on television and on radio, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm sick clear up to my chin with a lot of these radio preachers. Uh, they think they have to teach my people and the Word of God and, and milking uh, the religious public uh, to foster their own programs and they will not tell their listening audience how to find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I don't like it. And I'm a radio preacher and been on radio longer than all of them. And I want to tell you something, people. You, you need to listen. There is no substitute for doing that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. That's what the book said. All right, now notice. In verse 3, I want to get right into this. Notice. He, in the first month of his reign... Notice it now, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he got started. Amen. You know the real issue with all of us today? We don't know when to get started. We plan to do something. We plan to have something better. I'd like to have a better bus route. I'd like to have a better department. I'd like to have a better music program. I'd like to have this and that pertaining to, to religious work. But are you willing to pay the price to make these things happen? I can tell you one thing, and I can give you a personal testimony in my own life in the ministry, uh, that uh, I enjoy my Christianity and enjoy serving God. I enjoy all of these things. But I want to tell you something. When you're carrying a burden to help build educational institutions. You're helping to carry the burden of sending missionaries around the world and then pastoring a church and trying to minister the needs of people. You don't have much time to check out how you feel because your burden is there all the time. Have you ever had a, chick, a sick child in your home? Have you ever had an extended illness of one of your loved ones? You really don't have a very good time when there's a pressing need in your family for that sick infant or that sick child or your parents, your mother, your father. A woman told me the other day, she said, I, uh, Pastor Rawlings, I don't believe I can stand it, what I'm going through. And she had illness in the family. And I believe it's that way, brother, when you're carrying a burden to evangelize and try to get people saved. Many of you are at ease in Zion. You're not carrying a burden. You're not concerned about the people of Jerusalem, your Jerusalem. And that's what I'm talking about. If we want to go down in the country and look at the leaves, we go if we want to uh, take our boat and go to the river or we want to see tall stacks or anything of this sort like in our city and cut out on the services. Suppose everybody did that. Suppose everyone felt that way. I'm going to live my life like I want to. Son, we wouldn't be able to get anybody saved. It's the dedicated, consecrated people 
that love God and make the sacrifices, the ones that's going to have the rewards. When we get up there, notice in the first year, in the first month, this man is busy. Notice what he did. He opened the door of the house of the Lord and he repaired it. He had a positive program. He said, I, I've got to get this thing open. I've got to get this thing set straight. I have a, I have a work to do. I, I've got to do something. Are you that way or do you? You know, it's an amazing thing. And I want to be very clear. I want to be very straight. Uh, now in our, uh, in our early Sunday school, whenever people drive in, we don't bring our buses in. It's entirely up to the teachers and the superintendents who are responsible for visiting and working. You don't have anybody working for you in your class now. It's up to you. It's up to you to visit, to call, to minister to people. It's high time now that you realize, hey, there's not anybody doing my work. I'm going to have to do it myself. I think it's been a very revealing thing, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to be very plain about it, that when we switched around and started another Sunday school, suddenly we realized, hey, if I'm going to build a class, if I'm going to have a department, I'm going to have to cut out some of the extraneous things in my life and start serving God and not do it to make myself look good before my fellow man, but because I have a burden and I have a concern for the souls of teenage boys and girls and men and women and little fellows. Notice what he did. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he did something else. He, he developed a visitation program. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the East Street. He had a meeting. He gathered them together. didn't say that he desired them to come. It just tells us that he brought them in. I imagine he may, use, may have used some pretty strong language to get them there. They were not there. He brought them in. He brought in those that were responsible for the worship in the temple of God. And then the teachers, the priests, he got them together. They're all needed. And later on he tells us about bringing in the singers. Singing has always been connected with worship. That's why you have in the rock music field today, you have these people who are worshiping Satan through rock music. Do you understand that, that music? Listen, didn't it get real quiet, you kids listening? Do you understand that? That music is either connected with God and worship or with the devil and worship. There's just no in between. I mean, I mean that cuts close, doesn't it? All right, now listen. And look at the language uh, in one in USA Today. Did you see? Did you see the language of the music of Michael Jackson or Prince, whichever one it was? Not any difference much. Full double page spread and the words. I read that flying 39,000 feet in the air. I thought one of the great newspapers of America and carrying that. Don't they have any conscience? Don't they have any soul? Don't they have any self-respect? I'm talking about editors of great newspapers. You know, our newspaper, our newspaper field uh, by and large, has gone into the cesspools of iniquity. I remember a few years ago when our morning newspaper here would not carry some of the ads of the theaters because uh, as they thought that it was not proper some of the advertisement that they did. Everything goes today. Don't you understand that? And people like Madonna and Prince and Jackson and all of those fellows and those women, uh, you're, you haven't seen anything as to what we're going to see if there's not a turning around and God doesn't draw the sword of judgment. Hear me now, God will only put up with evil so long. And I read in the book of Revelation that that cup of iniquity is going to be full some of these days. I, I sometimes feel like I'm a pretty lonely voice preaching like I do against evil and against wickedness and all of this. You don't hear much of it Amen. anymore. 
People say, well, Reverend, you'd have a much bigger crowd if you would trim it. Honey, I'm not going to trim anything. You can take it like it is because it's truth. Notice, uh, let, me, let me show you that I'm on the right track. Look at verse 5. And here's what this great man, this young man, you young men, listen, started to reign in his mid-twenties, reigned 29 years. Look at him. What, he's, what he said to these, hear me, you Levites. And he's going to tell them to do three things. This command. Now notice what he said. He said, now sanctify yourself. Clean up your act. How about that? Sanctify yourself. Clean up your act. Get it done. That's plain language. Someone asked me out in uh, Yakima, Washington last week, said, Dr. Rawlings, if you heard Billy's son to preach, if he were preaching today or Mordecai Ham or those fellows, uh, would, they, would they be successful? I said, would they be successful? Of course they would. You're always successful when you preach the truth. You say, but maybe they wouldn't have the crowds. They wouldn't, but they'd still be successful. I said, you didn't ask me if they might have the crowds. You said, would they be successful? You're always successful. If you only have half a dozen people and you're telling them the truth, you're having success. Now notice, he said, clean up your act. Could I ask you, do you have any moral standards, young people? Have you been able to say no? I mean, you don't have to be a dope addict. I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I'm not being personal now, but there was a, a young person in our service today that I presume tried to take his own life. And uh, Matt Holman and I have been visiting that young chap and he was, his face was a gleam. He was, he was so happy today. He had 16 years old or 17, had despaired of living and tried to take his own life. These are the people I'm trying to help. Thank God there's a door open. Thank God there's a way out. You don't need to be despondent. The God of this universe is still on the throne. He has the ability to help us. But we have to do certain things that he said to do. He said, separate yourselves. Cut out some of this stuff. All right, now, number two, he said, when you clean up, then you go to the house of God. Notice it. Sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Set it apart. It's, it's holy unto the Lord. Where we meet to worship how we value things. I guess if I could pinpoint it, that's really what he's talking about. What kind of value system do you operate on? Do you have one that you've developed by yourself, sovereignly, without the word of God? Well, my friend, what moral standards I have, I got them out of this book. This book tells me how to treat my mother. This book tells me how to treat my father. This book tells me how to treat my wife. This book tells me how to treat my children. This book tells me how I'm to treat my neighbor. This book tells me how I'm to conduct myself in, the, in my church and to feed the flock of God over which I've been appointed an overseer. All right, notice sanctify the house of God. But notice how quickly he said, and clean house. Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. See, they had polluted the, the holy place like it was when Jesus took a whip in John chapter 2 and drove the money changers out of the temple. Those fellows set up a banking system. I mean, you talk about that bank in Washington. It was worse than that in the house of God. And he made a whip of cords and drove these money changers out of the temple. He said, well, I don't think Jesus ought to do that. You wait till he gets through with you. And you know what? Have you ever read that carefully? Did you know he turned over the money changers tables and scattered the money and, and he didn't tell them to turn the doves and, and pigeons loose that, had been, that were to be offered for sacrifice. God never makes a mistake. 
All right, now, he said in verse 6, Our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord and have forsaken him. Notice they had forsaken him. Now drop down to that text I, I read, and you will find four things in it. Now he said, sons, notice how tender he is. He said, be not now negligent, what I said a moment ago, to get busy the first year and the first month he rose early in the morning. He started on a course of action. And my friend, you may be as sincere as you can be, but you're going through life still planning to do something, but you never get around to it. When you're going to get started. A man said to me last week out in Washington State, he said, do you think I'm too old to preach? I said, No. I've got a friend who's had both legs shot off and he's preaching and doing a good job. The oldest man I have, I've ever had to surrender under my ministry was in his early 90s down in, in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee and he preached a few years. Past 90 years old. God will use some crooked sticks but you've got to be willing for him to use you. Now notice what he said here. Be not negligent for the Lord... Number one, he's chosen you. Now, what's he chosen us for? Number one, now notice it. It'll embarrass you to stand before him. Oh, I thought I could go see tall stacks and maybe go down and, uh, you know, just fool around and see the leaves and the trees and the grass and the cattle and, and just, no, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works, honey. You're going to have to get your thinking straight God said, I've chosen you to stand before me. That's why the Lord's day belongs to him. That's why prayer meeting night belongs to him. Visitation night belongs to him. All of these factors that I could call attention to. Stand before him. I've chosen you. Where are you when God's looking for you? That poor man in Psalms 142, he said, I looked on my left hand, on my right, and I could find no man to help me. Now listen to these tragic words. No man cared for my soul. Jesus said to this lame man, said, do you want to be healed? Well, it's certainly evident he was there at the pool, but the man said, when I would step down, he's crippled, he said, someone goes in before me. But Jesus wanted to know if the man wanted to be healed. He had to express it. And you know, my friend, God knows the negative in your heart. Whatever you do, the men who mow grass in this park, the people who keep these buildings, the people who work on the buildings, the preacher who stands in the pulpit, the teacher who has a class, the superintendent is responsible for that department, every one of us are to stand before him. Now notice number two, and serve him. I like that. That means work, work, work. That means get busy. Get you a tool. Get something started. Number three, and that you should minister unto him. Uh, that means that there's things that's got to be done. And then lastly, to burn incense, to worship him, to put away the evil, to sanctify that which is holy. And then you know what? In verse 20, Hezekiah the king rose early in the morning and I want you to notice this now, please. I want you to notice over here in verse 27. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the songs of the Lord began also with the trumpets. Things began to get together. Ladies and gentlemen, look. Joy only comes when we strip ourselves of our selfishness. Don't worry about smoking and drinking and gambling and, and uh, lewd uh, films and pornography and everything. How does it shape up with you and the Lord? You get close to him, these other things will drop off just like barnacles off of a ship. Let's stand with our heads bowed for a moment. And let's pray about some things. The joy, notice, when the burnt offerings were offered, the songs of the Lord began, and they began to play the trumpets. 
heads are bowed, has God spoken to your heart? Has God come within your heart? And like this young man I introduced a while ago, Tony, I want to ask you something. This young man not long ago has been worldly and serving the flesh and now in this church he's come to grips with reality and there are literally thousands of Tony Philpots in this city and all they need is somebody to go to them and begin to minister to them and God is preparing us to minister to those who desperately needs ministering to their heads bowed as God spoken to your heart as some of you have been playing with God and the things that he wants you to do uh, maybe to teach a class